We have a really good episode for you today, but a quick note. For some reason, my audio kept going in and out during this whole conversation. I didn't realize it at the time, so unfortunately, there is some audio issues with this episode, but there's still a lot of value to be gained in this, so I hope you do enjoy the show. Welcome to the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, your resource for clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships in healthcare. Learn how to earn letters of recommendation, prepare for your clerkship, and excel at patient care from preceptors with years of practice. We interview physician educators in every specialty and clinical setting to discuss how to prepare for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Here's your host and MedEd entrepreneur, Chase DeMarco. I'm happy to be joined today by Neil Desai, a family physician, contributor to the Happy Doc podcast, and co-founder of MedFlashGo, a voice-based medical flashcard system. Neil has 15 years of clinical experience and is here to discuss family practice clinical education for us. Neil, it's my pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks so much, Chase. Excited to be here. Great. Just to break the ice a little bit, I started adding this new thing, and I wanted to know, what is either the scariest or the funniest thing that you've ever seen in a hospital setting? Can we do both? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Let's do both. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. I'm just going to lay it out there because I'm just going to own my stuff. And I usually would probably swear, but I'll, I'll keep it like, I'll keep it G rated <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, here. So let me go start with my very first day of clinic. And just let me just preface this by saying, just because this happens to me, doesn't mean it's going to happen to any medical student out there, but I'll just kind of, it's, it's always fun to look back at some of these things. So here we go. So the first my very first day of clinical rotations was OBGYN. And my very first day, they were uh, I was with a midwife and they were doing a pap smear on a, I think it was a, a pregnant girl, teenage girl. And it was like an inner city Brooklyn. And I don't know what happened that day, but I was just, I got really hot, lightheaded. And then basically I passed out. So oh, no. Not only did I pass out, but I basically put a hole in the wall. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So the funny part was the reaction of both the patient and the midwife. The patient was like, is it really serious? Like, has he ever seen that before? And the midwife just said, apparently not. And then went back to doing her thing. <laughs> and was like, So yeah, that was my very first day, first experience on first day of ob and rotation. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's one story. For, that, that was me, right? <laughs> Two, the second one, I guess you could kind of call, call it Gary, sort of. I was on that same rotation later in the, I guess this is a crazy rotation to start with, but like I was with the, doing like a outpatient PAP clinic for the inner city and there was an attending. So I was kind of like right next to her. I was in the hallway, but, but I was kind of shadowing her and other doctors. So anyway, she went in to do a pap smear on, on a patient in the inner, on the inner city. She had a blanket over her. And when she was about to do the pelvic, she lifted the, she had like a blanket. She lifted it up right when she was about to do a pap a flood of basically roach cockroaches came out and oh, i'm not i'm not kidding you like oh, the attending my. screamed ran out of the room and was like oh like it was just it was just like okay <laughs> so those are, i guess you could call it scary funny memorable those are the two stories that is <laughs> the stuff of nightmares how is that possible yeah yeah. Oh, yeah. And then on that same, just to add to that same, this is a crazy rotation on the on the same rotation uh, because the the OB on the OB side, there, I was a medical student I was rotating with. She ended up like on the weekend delivering a baby in the elevator while on the way up, like by herself. <laughs> <laughs> it's like stuff in movies and TVs. I'm like, does yeah. this stuff really happen? And it's like, yeah, she did. You know, it was, it was kind of crazy. I know <laughs> but, that actually happened. <laughs> no, neither did I until like, wait, is this like, does this stuff actually happen? I mean, it's, I don't know, maybe things have changed. I don't know, things probably still happen like that, but this is in like the, you know, I, I've told you this, but I'm 46. So this is in the 90s, so late 90s, <laughs> you know. But yeah, those are things that like stick with you for the rest of your life. <laughs> wow. You know? I those are going to be hard to beat for any future yeah. guests. You know, right? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted, I wanted to start up, set the tone, start up with like <laughs> where we're going here. I want to be like top memorable podcast here. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Well on your way. <laughs> yeah. Right. So a little bit about your clinical practice, like what kind of educational setting are you in for family practice? Is it a clinic, hospital, mixture? Yeah. So I am in basically in a suburban setting, kind of like community setting. I am a uh, family physician. I do pretty much all outpatient ambulatory care, office-based primary care. 
So a lot of uh, my patients are usually in the, I'm in Northern Kentucky, so I'm right outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. So most of our patients are pretty much in the Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky, uh, Northeast Indiana metropolitan area, that tri-state area. And we see patients from pretty much that area uh, in the outpatient setting. With the outpatient students that you use or that you have with you at your facilities, is it mostly MDs and DOs or do you have other variations as well? Yeah, there are di- there are different levels. There, are, I mean, most of the, what I teach are usually more on the introduction to clinical medicine side. So usually, most are first year and second year MD students, DO students. But we've also had like because we we also have nurse practitioner students because we work with nurse practitioners. Yeah, and then there are medical students from different backgrounds in healthcare rotating through our office. That's interesting to have first and second year students there because I know a lot of schools, including mine, still don't have any clinical experience in the first two years, not till third. Right. This is actually a new initiative. I mean, University of Cincinnati, it's like an introduction to clinical primary care course. And then also what we're starting this year, because University of Kentucky is actually has, they just opened a campus up here in Northern Kentucky. So one of their inaugural classes, actually, it's a good timing, is just starting this year. And what they're actually developing, I think this is a good model for other medical schools is basically a kind of mentorship where it doesn't necessarily have to be traditional. You can have the formal shadowing, but they also have more just someone to just lean on for medical training, medical career advice, life advice, just to kind of like almost like a big brother, big sister kind of thing. Um, Just, Hey, I I need some, you know, what do you think about, I want to do this specialty or who should I talk to or struggling with how do I life stuff or like how do I the different aspects of our medical training because a lot of the things are kind of depends on one's context and what you want to achieve so I think it's really good to have that this is a theme that we'll talk about later that theme to stay connected and within our uh with ourselves but also our colleagues and our and our calling that's that's a big thing for what I do uh, on the happy doc but also like in, in teaching medical students that's really awesome. I agree. That's a very useful model. I hope more start to use that because being so segregated from basic sciences to clinical sciences really makes it difficult for students. They don't know what to expect. They don't know what they want to go in. They might have heard a profession at one point or a specialty that they're interested in, but without any actual experience in the day to day, you don't have the slightest idea what you're going to right. actually be good at or enjoy over the long term. Yeah, it's kind of like a crapshoot and you're just like, I think you only get like a, a window. You don't really see what it's like, the day, like you were saying, the day to day. I think the problem is a lot of us really, because we're all so busy, you never really get to just talk to people as a human. What is their perspective on like medicine and healthcare and just their field, where it is, where it's been, where it is and where it's going. And then what are, what if they were in charge, what are their solutions or what are if they were in charge of everything. And I think if we, if you start listening, I think that's why these great tools, what you're doing, what Taylor does with the happy doc, what we do also is such a undervalued tool. And I don't think it's done enough. And that's one, another thing that I promote is these digital creative outlets to maintain yourself. I actually have a thesis that I think that everyone should do it because I think it's actually the cure for one imposter syndrome and two burnout. That is my thesis because I've seen this over the last 20 years. So I have a unique perspective. We can get into that a little later if you're interested. Wow. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And I agree. I must have learned so much more from podcasts over the past you know, few years than I ever would have been able to access through just my school's resources. Right. So getting into the preceptor type questions, especially for your specialty in more community family medicine, what do you feel makes a good or a great preceptor? Right. So I took some notes because my short attention span here would be all over the place. So, but you know, I gotta like so uh, stay patient with me here. But I want to I want to make sure I get these points right. So one thing that I do is that we are the as fam- family doctors, primary care, we are the quarterbacks of the healthcare system. If we don't kind of coordinate things, get people in right kind of formations, get the right tools, resources, personnel, and the right thing, we won't achieve our goals which is obviously ultimately, which is for patients to take charge of their health. And we both want good health outcomes, right? To optimize their health, mental, physical, emotional, uh, to achieve what they want to do. It's pretty much part of our job as well as their responsibility. So how do we do that? That is what I like to do is kind of promote that role. And also it's, we, because of that role, it's a very special, unique, intimate relationship. We're the first line of contact. A lot of times, good, bad, everything in between. Right. So that's good and bad. It's it's a double edged sword. Uh, But the other thing is, but the the good is that we can emphasize prevention before we have to send them to the specialists before they're like, 
have all the complications and all that, you know, it, it's better to be proactive than reactive. And our thing is they've done studies that communities that have more primary care physicians have better outcomes. I mean, that's just intuitive, you know, that makes sense. Um, yeah. but I, I think the problem is all the other incentives of the healthcare system status compensation, all that gets tied in. Uh, so that's, that is kind of the barriers. And I think there's also stereotypes. And I think a lot of medical students have those stereotypes. Oh, you can't make money, a primary care physician, which we want to flip that script also too. That That's not the only thing, but it is a huge thing because things like student debt and all the other, I don't need to tell you guys, you know, yeah, this, to the choir. Right? Yeah. So, but the whole thing is basically what it, so my role is pretty much to promote that field as quarterback of the healthcare system. How, do, how do you kind of coordinate everything that part of like, make sure everything is where it needs to be. People are doing work in the places they need to be to be successful to uh, helping patients, empowering patients with the knowledge mindset, you know, kind of tools, giving them the tools to be successful based on their context, because it's individualized also based on their resistance to treatment, non-compliance, all this other stuff, learning that art. So my thing is to really, these are like the quote unquote EQ soft skills, but really kind of doubling, tripling down on that. That's going to be really important as we go forward with everything becoming like more digital, computerized. What's going to stay uh, constant is the human connection. And my thing is triple, quadruple down on the art of the human connection. And that's what I want to imbue like the next generation, or I don't know what the right word is, but like, you know, I, I think you know what I say, like basically like kind of pound that in that like learn that art of like just being able to listen and being able to have compassion and being able to figure out what is the underlying story of each patient. Why are they non-compliant? The bigger picture, that, that kind of thing. And then if you can take care of that, understand the bigger factors that in a patient's world, that will help you to get the, the metrics and, and the healthcare things that you, uh, objectives that you want to achieve. Yeah. Adding the human aspect to primary care especially seems to be a, a big topic of debate in multiple different fields that I don't need to get into all of right now, but right. adding that and sort of getting away from the 15 minutes per patient and the really commercialized insurance-based yep. system is a huge, huge um, need and definitely a good focus that a lot of physicians are kind of spearheading. So I'm, I'm glad to see that is really taking a foothold and really moving fast. Yeah, but this actually comes from my own frustration because what you just described is exactly a lot of what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis currently. But again, you're going to see like these themes where I'm like, okay, this is the current system as it is. And what I would argue is that the current system is outdated. We're practicing in a 20th century model in a 21st century world with outdated technology from like last century. My whole thing, one of the taglines that we say all the time, and this is kind of one of our missions, is we need to start teaching, learning, creating, and practicing medicine in the century we live in. What does that mean? Basically leveraging things like podcast technology. I mean, the amount of inefficiency and waste in the system that's so clearly bypassed by things that you're doing just by like, by us doing a podcast, you even just said it just yourself, you, know, you learn more than in like, I'm sure than a lot of your clinical rotations and talking to me or talking to a lot of your other guests, <laughs> yeah, right? Definitely. <laughs> yeah. And it's free. That's the other thing. That's the best part too. Yeah, yeah. especially yeah, students have enough debt. We really don't need to be charging for expensive third-party resources to educate them on this material. Just have a discussion. You can get much more from it anyway. Exactly. That's It's the long-term ROI on that. It's priceless. So what are some of the more unsafe practices that you've seen as far as preceptors in family medicine? So a couple unsafe things in my specialty. The biggest thing, and this goes back to the human element, is ego too much arrogant. What I've said, one of the things that I, I, I'm a big advocate, because I, I don't think we mentioned this, but I actually have a son with special needs. He has a rare genetic condition. So here's something of value for your listeners. If they're taking, he has osteogenesis imperfecta. So it's the brittle bone disease. So if he's, the, the common thing that you see on the boards exams is blue sclera and brittle bones. That's a common thing, mm -hmm. but it's more complex than that because there's been a lot of advancements in treatments and surgeries and therapies. That's the side. Just from my experience on that side and being a physician and a student, the biggest thing that I've always said that is a challenge to all of us in healthcare is what I call arrogant ignorance, where you think you know too much and you're full of yourself because no one knows everything. And that is a big thing. People think, yeah, you can have like all the letters after your name and you can get the top scores. But at the end of the day, there's always something you don't know and you can always learn more. 
we're constantly trying to learn. That's what we try. We need to be perpetual students and teachers. That's our career. That's what we do, right? So my thing is never stop learning. Never think that you're too full of yourself. So the way I look at it is like flatline, as in the sense, not like an EKG flatline, like you have no pulse or, you know, like, but flatline the sense that you don't get too high or don't get too low. So don't, don't basically don't get too full of yourself, but don't beat yourself up when you make a mistake. Just figure out how can I learn from that? So that goes to the other, on the other end, but that's more about humility and modesty and being able to learn from your failures. So yeah, I think that's one thing. And then the other thing is the arrogance. The other thing is being mindful of your arrogance, how you're treating others. This is simple, golden rule. Treat others like you want to be treated if you are a patient or your, if it was your colleague or your friend or your mother or your sister or brother or kid or son or daughter, same thing. Just from our end, I think it's really just having that humility to know that it's a privilege to do what we do and an honor to kind of uh, to basically take care of our patients. And I think the biggest mistakes were when people like make quick judge- judgments or cut patients off or just because it, it, it can, it's not good care because you don't, if you're not listening, then you miss important clues that may help you to really get to your goal. And I think sometimes we, be, we need to be more mindful of that. So arrogant ignorance where you may be missing thing that could be detrimental to a patient's health. That would be my biggest thing. Do you see this more in the physician acting with the patient, the physician acting with the students, the student acting with the patient, all of the above? It can be all of the above. Yeah, I've seen it all. So that's why I say this is global. This is universal. Whether we're talking with colleagues, you know, talking about about your fellow colleagues, or we're talking about a patient, yeah, the student, or just making those judgments kind of thing. I think that is, and, and I know, I know the culture. It can be very cynical, very skeptical, and very snarky. I get it because we're under a lot of stress and it's our way to rationalize or to, it's like a coping mechanism to you're dealing with a lot of serious stuff. So I understand it, but I would also say that it's like, it's sometimes it's important to catch ourselves. And I, we all have bad days. That's fine. You're going to be short. Sure. I've done it. I'm sure you've done it. I think everybody's, we're just, you're human, but not beat ourselves up, but try to aspire to be like, to try to like perfect our craft and our art of medicine and really being true to our calling. I know it's ideal and maybe up there, but it's like, but I think we can never always try to be better. That I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I guess to delve into that just a little bit deeper. So if a student is on a rotation in family medicine, since this is the we're using right mm-hmm. now, and their preceptor is showing these, let's say negative attributes, are there any actions that they could potentially take or should take or should be aware of not to take maybe? Just kind of observe, be like, t- it's data. Like, why is this doctor treating this patient? Oh, maybe you had a bad day. Like, just figuring out why are they doing what they're doing? And then also figuring out, does is that consistent with my values and like how I want to practice as a physician? Probably not. Because we all experience so many physicians and different styles through our training. I look, I look at it like fish. Like if you're fishing, like some fish are good, some are bad, some are interesting, some are unique. Pick the ones that you want and learn from the ones that like, I would say, I will never do that you know, that is an example of what not to do. I would never do that to my patient. But then on the other end, it makes the stand out where someone went the extra mile, did something like, wow, that is awesome. I want to be like that. Take those. So you kind of take it together. So it comes, it gives you your own unique kind of curriculum. What I call, what what we call in our happy doc ecosystem, we call it the hidden curriculum. These are the things that you pick up on when you're watching, like how how your attendings interact with other peers and other patients, take what you like, put it into your bank, you know, your memory bank, and then use it in how you interact with patients. Because I, I feel this is a common theme. Like a lot of times physicians who were kind of beaten down or abused or kind of like treated badly, they just repeat the cycle with the next generation of students. And the op, I think a lot of times attendings who were really kind of take, had people take them under their wing, mentored them, really show them the skill and art of medicine, they, they've done that with their, their students also. I think there's a lot to be said for both ends, like, you know, which one gives you more energy, which excites you. But yeah, I think the key getting back to what to learn, I would say take a filter out what you don't want. Just say, okay, this is what they do. I wouldn't do that. I would probably do things differently. And then people that do what you would do, try to like do more of that and like kind of in your own way. Don't try to be someone else though. You have to figure out you and do you on your own way, but have different influences here. That makes any sense. Yeah. So be aware of the different personalities, the different potential reasons, question it, and then pick which ones suit you best and which ones not to follow. Right. Okay. I like that. 
And as far as past mistakes or learning experiences that you've gone through, are there any particular ones that stand out that you really, either yourself or someone around you has done that you're like, wow, that really taught me something new? I think on the mistakes or or learning experience, same, I think I touched on this earlier, where I've kind of like, I'll admit I'm not perfect. I'm like, none of us are. I'm like, I'm human. But like, I've had bad days, just like good days, you know? So I've overjudged a patient. I've been short with a patient didn't get enough sleep, you know, this post call, and you're just like, I can barely, bre- I can barely breathe right now. And I'm just like, right? just don't look at me like, you know, how that is another thing we talk about connection, a big thing of what we do, what we're doing here. And what we do in medicine is, is communication. So I would always say my mistake, or one of the things I would learn to do is err on the side of over communication in everything. Because my biggest mistakes were when I didn't communicate, I, you know, because you're like, with a patient, they're like, nobody told me this. You never told me this, right? What was going on? No one's telling, nobody knows what's going on, right? One, yeah. two, or they told me the wrong information. Well, this doctor told me this, right? That, they told me that, right? You're like, how often do you hear that? Three, then the other thing is like, uh, yeah, or under, under communication. Now on the other end, if you flip that and you say, you can never over communicate, like I'm talking to my 10 year old, be like, look, these are the expectations. You got to go to bed. Da, 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 da. You can never say it too much. If you treat it that way, you talk to your. I mean, and I know it sounds kind of patronizing, but I'm not saying that to be patronizing. I'm saying it as a, as a, a strategy because when you think that, hey, I need to over communicate with everyone, so no one can ever be like, well, you never told me that. Whether it's uh, an organization you work with, an academic institution you work with, your spouse, <laughs> your patients, your colleagues. I think it's just a great way to live life is that over communication, this is what I'm doing. And, and it's better that like you tell it a hundred times and people are on the same page than, you know, once and people are like, you never told me that in relations. I can tell you from my wife will tell you about that. Like how many times I messed up, like she'll tell you, uh, she'll, she'll talk and uh, probably don't want to talk to her, but like <laughs> she'll tell you all about it. Right? <laughs> For the, uh, the actual model of the one minute preceptor, we have the five steps can we go over an example of each one and how you've potentially used it with students you've precepted for in the past? Mm-hmm. So the first one is to get a commitment. How would you go about getting a commitment from your students? Yeah, so I think one of the things, like sometimes when a patient comes with a chief complaint, let's say something like a lot of times in primary care, it's vague, something like fatigue or general fatigue, or like I'm just not feeling well. You can't really, you know, so then it starts the process. Like, well, then we start that process. Well, what are you thinking based on, we basically kind of start ask, I start kind of asking the questions. What are you thinking based on your history, physical, patient's context? So that's one thing, basically getting that. What is your differential? And then we kind of, that is getting that. And then once we get, they committed to a specific diagnosis, then we go down that path. Okay. So you're asking sort of guiding questions and trying to make them come up with single. Yeah. The art of like the process of learn of thinking, right? Isn't there also the art of pimping? I think is. Uh... Yeah. I, I don't know if it's pimping as much, but, but I, I I don't try to pimp too much. I try to more like just lead a little bit. <laughs> like cause I don't think pimping. I don't I don't think it's. Uh, I didn't like it, and I, I don't think it really does much as much as more like it doesn't stick, right? It's like because yeah. you're more afraid of getting the right answer as opposed to learning the long term concept, you know. So it's more like creating a friendly kind of like environment to just so they really get excited as much as I do about this stuff. I mean, if they're not going to be I said, because I'm like, when students go through my rotation, because I know how they a lot of students are like, why well, I got to do this. It's just like, I'm not even gonna go do this. But I think a lesson, I know I'm going on the side here. But <laughs> one of the lessons I just want to get it out is that basically that there is something to learn, even though you may not think I'll never use this. I never thought let me just personally, I never thought I would need to know orthopedics as much as like, or this rare genetic condition, then my son was born with it. So until you think that you don't know until you do, and uh, you, you could be diagnosed with something, your mom, your sister, brother, cousin, friend, and then all of a sudden you need to know, you, like you want to learn everything about it and they ask you about it and they're like, you don't know. So that's why I think there's some value. You don't know in the short term, long term, you'd be like, oh, I remember reading about this. I have some basic knowledge. I saw that. I think that there's something to be said for like, really valuing the rotations, even if you're not going to go into that field, because medicine's all inter- it's all interconnected. Got it. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of material that would fall into that category for most of us. Like, I'm not going into that. Right. Yeah. Right. 
For the uh, second step, probing for supporting evidence, it sounded like we've kind of covered them that already. You're, you're guiding them yeah. and trying to get them to uh, more in-depth questions about what they think. So step three is to reinforce what was done well. Yeah. So then if they'll be like, all right, why do you think it's, let's say, like endocrinology, like diabetes? Like, So we'll kind of integrate. What are the symptoms of diabetes? What, are, what, what would you expect? What are the risk factors for diabetes for this patient? So it's basically what it is. It's, it's kind of like, yeah, so reinforcing what they're, what they're seeing clinically based on their clinical examination findings, history taking, and using that intuitive kind of skill with their knowledge base. And, and then kind of like saying that's correct, like this is consistent with what you're saying, but then also saying, well, this goes against in, in this part, if they say something else, saying like, well, this would go against that, but this supports that. Basically like getting them to basically prove, uh, give evidence for their most likely diagnosis. So it sounds like you actually covered step three and four there, what they did right and what they did wrong. And so you're reinforcing it with the supporting integrated evidence. Right. Like, okay, you got it right because this, this, and that, or you got it wrong or missed this, that, and that. Right. And then is there a particular way that you go about teaching general principles or clinical pearls? Yeah. So basically, if they have, like, if we have a patient that comes in with uncontrolled diabetes or something, like, I, it, the, the really things that stick are, like, like, the stories, right? I think when you show them, like, particular physical findings, like, this is what happens when your diabetes is not controlled, you end up with heart macro and microvascular complications, retinopathy, neuropathy, uh, you know, vascular complications like amputations, kidney failure, all, all chronic kidney disease. So these are the things like this is the, re and then I integrate primary care concepts. Like the reason we do what we do is to make sure this doesn't happen. And then when you see it, you're like, oh, okay, this, and then what it looks like, you don't want them to get to that, a lot of patients to get to that stage where you're in reactive mode or more proactive mode and keeping patients healthy and kind of uh, keep uh, primary care preventive measures. And that's our, that's our bread and butter, you know, to kind of do that. So it's basically the, always incorporating how can we have prevented this or, you know, or what can we do to prevent complications? How are we maximizing their preventive uh, measures uh, so that they can be healthy and, you know, live longer and not go see specialists that they don't need to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can read about these in questions and textbooks, but getting the actual experiential learning and connecting the dots right. is very useful. That would make the general principle stick a lot better in its total, uh, in its full realm and full aspect of it versus just the little tidbit you might be questioned on. Right. And that's it for part one of this episode. There is so much valuable information from Dr. Neil decided that we had to split this one into two parts. So please join us again next week for part two with Dr. Neil Desai. Hey, y'all. This is Chase DeMarco. I wanted to tell you about my recently published book, Read This Before Medical School, with my co-authors, Greg Rodden and Ted O'Connell. In it, we cover study tips, educational design, mnemonics creation, and more. If you want the latest in medical education and evidence-based learning methods, check out Read This Before Medical School by clicking on the link in the show notes or visiting your favorite online bookstore. You can also download our free Essentials of ebook by going to freemeded.org slash medstudent.